Burn a mat a uh, hundred odd years ago was um, something more like this. Um, it was the kind of heart of a fledgling city and it was the place uh, at which all of the kind of important things in the city happened. Um, by the time I got to it at about 11 or 12 it was, uh, it was kind of disgusting. This was a place where I had my shoes stolen when I came to play in the spacey parlour in the basement of one of these buildings. Uh, and uh, it had become this kind of vile uh, bus depot um, and a real kind of, um, a really despised part of the city. And um, by the time I got back as an adult, uh, I was setting up the studio with Pip, um, it had become a kind of total wasteland and uh, the, had this kind of carapace of buildings around the outside that were kind of interesting but really in terrible, terrible condition and occupied uh, mainly by kind of pigeons and prostitutes. It was just a, um, a really kind of difficult bit of the city and a difficult um, place to imagine uh, a kind of good future. Um, when we got started, uh, you know, it was so bad that we had to bring in bulldozers to just kind of clear out the floors. And, you know, on some of the floors, the pigeon crap was this deep. Um, there was one extraordinary day when uh, we saw a bunch of guys walking across the square with um, golf clubs over their shoulders and they went into one of these buildings and boarded up all the windows and doors and just got this kind of bloodlust and um, killed like 200 pigeons with golf clubs in this kind of frenzy of, of death. It was really kind of awful. And I think it's important um, sitting in here with the sun streaming in and plants and trees and stuff to just understand that uh, that's where this place has come from. Uh, it's not a point of neutrality. It was um, five or six years before we even believed that we stood a chance of pulling this off as a kind of, uh, as a place in which the future of Auckland might yet be defined. Um, and one of the first projects that I did under my own steam, having kind of spent half a decade or so working uh, directly for Pip, was uh, the sort of restaurant, uh, Cafe Hanoi, and, um, uh, and the kind of two buildings that it sits within directly on the other side of that brick wall. Um, and it was, a, it was a really kind of terrifying thing because I hadn't done a restaurant before. In fact, I really hadn't really done anything before except an apartment fit out. And um, restaurants are these scary things because, um, well, halfway through I realised everybody I know is going to go to this place and um, a whole lot of people are going to write reviews and publish them in newspapers and the whole world's going to read it. Um, and uh, what if it sucks? And um, uh, for all of that kind of fear, there was also a kind of real exhilaration because here was an opportunity to take architecture outside of this kind of domestic realm that's usually constrained within in this country and start to shunt it out into uh, the rest of the world, into uh, you know, the lives of a, a, of a lot of people. Um, and you can see at, at Hanoi, we were still dealing with that kind of ruination. You can see that uh, even in the space that we were shaping carefully around people, um, that we were leaving this kind of trace of uh, dilapidation and uh, falling down concrete and, and kind of plaster uh, in place so that we could start to build a tension here between that, uh, between that kind of um, awfulness and that, and that bright future, that it wouldn't just be uh, like a mall where everything was polished, that down here there would be a drama between that kind of old crumbling decay and this, and this kind of new future. And uh, it started to kind of generate um, a culture that quickly began to run away that said that uh, Britomart would be the new home of, uh, of food and of entertainment in the city, or at least liquor-based entertainment in the city. Um, and, uh, you know, Abisu and, and Mexico and so on followed very quickly after that um, and, and really started to establish this as a kind of, um, no longer a kind of wasteland with one or two bright points, but actually a kind of really identifiable precinct in the, in the city. Um, you know, Britain Map became a kind of a thing in itself um, for the first time. And at the same time, we were doing 1885 next door, and uh, we were trying to shape this very, very beautiful space that again played off the delicacy of these little glass floral mosaics against huge, great 
hundred year old hand hewn lumps of timber and, uh, and doing so in spaces that have been uh, kind of rubbish dumps um, for a very long time. And it started to generate this kind of incredibly uh, wild culture. You know, there'd be five or six hundred kids swirling inside of 1885, just kind of wasted and queues three blocks down the street. And um, the thing was kind of turning into this, uh, this kind of incredibly energetic theatre. And it was a kind of concentrated theatre that I don't think the city had had for a very long time, if ever. Um, and so that all seemed very exciting. But, um, uh, and, you know, again, we capitalised on that excitement with this place that we're sitting in now. We dragged some of that kind of big, dark, pubby kind of stuff out into the light and built this kind of hedge fund that we called BCC um, and, uh, and carried on through Mexico and so on. But all of these things um, were dealing with a kind of a liquor-based entertainment still. You know, Brutamart was a party place. It was extraordinary at one o'clock on a Saturday morning but one o'clock on a Saturday afternoon was kind of desultory still. So we had this thing that was working kind of part of the time, but not the rest of the time. And so we sat back for a kind of couple of weeks and tried to figure out what was going on and what needed to happen next. And uh, the goal we thought uh, really kind of clearly was um, to do to Brunemart's days what we had already done to its nights. And um, Milsay is kind of almost the end product of, of that process. Um, we set about tackling uh, a half city block on the other side of, of, of this block um, and trying to, instead of make a kind of architectural set piece, uh, to choreograph um, a different kind of story about Brunemart and a story that was about a kind of beautiful life and a story that was built um, mainly around women rather than men because uh, we already had all this kind of blokey sort of stuff, but also we reasoned, you know, if you look after the woman, then the men will just come anyway. You know, we're just that simple. Um, and uh, started this project that's become the pavilions, this kind of this leafy garden through which uh, little uh, boutique stores and um, makeup houses are kind of strung. And what we had learned about this place was that um, uh, if you delivered extraordinary food and beverage, um, you could take people almost anywhere. You know, like that would that was just like this kind of secret weapon that would make anything work. And um, that retail on its own. Uh, without that support would always be slightly kind of marginalised. And so right from the outset we understood that we had to have this very uh, strong but delicate and kind of female focused uh, uh, menu offering that offset some of this kind of beer swilling stuff. And um, we started to seduce really intensively a, a group that we'd been engaged with over five or six years trying to get them to kind of believe in Brita Mart. Um, and it was a group called Hip Group who had five or six of the best cafes in the city. And we were convinced that they were the people to do this and uh, slid them into the middle of this, this little development and um, set up this garden-based uh, bistro. And um, as we're about halfway through the project, I think we just started kind of building the whole thing. We realised um, that we needed just a little bit more, and um, there were these series of little old, little old, little rubbish rooms and storerooms and, and kind of service courtyards at the back of all the retail stores um, that seemed to hold a kind of potential that uh, was wasted in storing kind of uh, clean sacks full of junk, and we begged and borrowed and stole from three or four different tenants these leftover spaces um, and tried to sting together enough space, pardon me, <coughs> enough space to make something that would be kind of viable as a, as a restaurant and that we could, um, that we could use to deliver, deliver the kind of real jewel of that, of that little development. And um, that space was down the back of a little alleyway, a little cobbled alleyway alongside the Ortolana um, Bistro and um, we had learnt from uh, Cafe Hanoi, the, first, the very first restaurant, that um, if you're going to push people down a back alley, if you're going to make something hard to find, and at Hanoi the example was the bathrooms, you know, you had to go through the back of the bar and down some kind of vinyl clad stairs and into a concrete kind of crumbling corridor, you had to deliver a jewel at the end of that kind of journey, right? Um, you know, if you're going to make the journey bad, then make it really bad, but make sure the ending's really good. And so we delivered these little kind of jewel-like dressing rooms. Um, and so we were convinced really early on that uh, this little 
uh, restaurant, it needed to be that jewel. So it needed to deliver, deliver these kind of incredibly beautiful, saturated colours, sugary treats uh, in a space that was completely unlike anything that we had here. Um, and sitting alongside that was this kind of, uh, this idea that um, as a culture matures, it should begin to leave behind uh, this perpetual search for what that culture is. You know, we've spent uh, at least a century uh, in most aspects of the kind of creative, creative culture trying to define what New Zealandness is, and we wanted to make a space that had nothing to do with that, um, that was simply um, completely immersive and completely um, transporting, that when you stepped across the threshold, you would go somewhere else uh, entirely. Um, the challenge was that because there had been three or four different rubbish rooms stuck together to make a restaurant, um, uh, we had this really kind of challenging geometry with four different ceiling heights and some of them were sloped and some of them were flat, some of them were tall, some of them were low, and a floor plan that kind of bulged inwards and outwards. Um, and into there we had to fit a kind of, um, an industrial, uh, industrial sized kitchen and um, uh, a little bar to service that whole kind of block. and uh, and a retail store and a restaurant. Uh, and it's the whole entire thing is like 80 square meters, DJ, something like that. So tiny. Um, and it meant that we needed to find a kind of a geometry and a, a method of space making that was unlike uh, anything that we had used before and that could adapt itself to all of those kind of challenges and, um, uh, and do so with some kind of uh, elegance and, and singularity and so what we did was this we built a, um, a, a mathematical system a, a really um, smart young guy in our studio Ian Scott built this this um, this model and a piece of software called uh, Grasshopper which plugs into another bit of software called Rhino and lives within this thing called the zoo and um, essentially built uh, a, a kind of um, a parametric system for first of all creating and defining and then secondarily controlling really really precisely uh, this geometry. So it looks kind of like a circuit diagram. Each of the blobs on those diagrams is kind of like a rule set, you know, if, if A then this, if B then that, or if, you know, closer to zero than this, or closer to 100 than this. Um, and you can see there's a huge number of those kind of rules. It becomes a very complex little beast. But in that complexity, um, as a, you know, of that complexity comes a real simplicity of production. So you put a huge amount of time in, in the studio, but in production, uh, all of a sudden you have huge control and an incredibly kind of streamlined fabrication process. So um, we started by modeling the kind of crude volume of the space, um, which are the kind of yellow lines around this magenta stuff, and then pushing and pulling uh, a fluid geometry through that space so that, um, you know, we, we wanted a kind of fluidity in order to deal with all of that complexity without t always kind of turning corners um, to give us a shot at delivering a singular uh, and, and elegant experience. And, um, uh, and then at that point we kind of, you know, we had a, a crude plaster, plasticine-like kind of space. Um, we stopped and kind of went back to the beginning and started to interrogate um, what that needed to kind of physically feel like. You know, it's one thing to define the geometry of, um, of, uh, of the future, but it's another thing to understand what that means in terms of human experience. And one of our frustrations in the studio with the most kind of avant-garde of architecture is that it's really um, dismissive of, of, of the human experience. You know, there are all of these heroes of ours um, operating out of, uh, Japan or, or um, you know, the Toyotas and the Hadids in Europe and all of those people who are pushing the kind of technological limits of architecture very, very hard, but seeming always to completely ignore the kind of human component. There's nothing about the kind of grooves in the fingertips or the hairs or the ends of your earlobes. Um, they all seem to be kind of utterly without material. So we started to um, investigate this uh, largely Arabic history of, of dessert making and uh, the geometries that lived within that tradition and the geometries of the kind of crystalline structures of sugars and so on and started to feed into this uh, geometric model um, another kind of uh, layer that said let's make this fluid form actually a crystalline form as if we were sliding inside of one of these things and, um, and then let's uh, use it as the single and only defining uh, element in the space so that um, 
you can see in this model here what we've changed since the previous one. The previous one projects each of these facets out onto the, um, onto the surrounding surfaces and creates these tiny little um, nodes wherever it hits. The next model uh, describes what happens when we add something into that system diagram that says the closer one of those points gets to transparency, the closer one of those points gets to one of those standard aluminium glass shop front windows, the more transparent it becomes. The closer it gets to a solid bit of fireproof shitty jib board, the more opaque it becomes. Um, and then layered onto that, um, this um, fractal geometry that we've drawn out of that Arabic uh, history of, of carved um, Musharabi panels that would allow us to deliver that kind of contraction and dilation from solid to transparent um, with at a kind of scale that was again down to the kind of fingertips that was um, that was finely finely grained and, and, and humane in scale and out of that popped um, I don't know Ian how many like a couple of thousand uh, triangular faces uh, each of which was an in individual um, and uh, so this is all, ha all happening in the studio, each of which was um, uh, recessed slightly in four or five places to take little brass cabinetry hinge hinges, each of which had a tiny little uh, number etched in its corner so that they could be kind of located in the greater matrix. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, the idea was that we would put them together and that they would end up like this. Um, and we would get a geometry that would fold itself across the ceiling and wall and window uh, equally that would at its points meet with a little star in which we could place these constellations of lights to pick out the, um, the, the little desserts below. Um, and um, that, yeah, that we would inlay into that a really kind of finely grained decorative quality so that um, your experience of this thing, as I keep saying, would just be, you know, the small next to your head and the light would project through the windows through these little, uh, little chinks in the timber and that it would be timber rather than plastic or metal or, uh, or kind of as all of Japan seems to do, white painted stuff. Um, and the hope was that the sum total would be something like this. this is a watercolour by um, a young architect, DJ Tai, in our studio who's worked really closely with me on all of our projects in Pritamart. And um, uh, we wanted, I guess you can see here the manifestation of this desire to make something that was completely somewhere else. Um, Pardon me, that was uh, almost like kind of stepping into a cave, but that, that caveness would be just leavened with uh, a fragility, that there would be these little perforations and points of kind of um, break in that intensity, um, and that would collectively um, mean that these little golden and crimson treats would just kind of shine in, in this little dark wooden cave. Um, and so that, that this is kind of what it, what it generated. There's this little slipway of retail space with uh, uh, some glass vitrines sitting underneath a great big kind of barrel vaulted um, uh, gallery um, with some folded plates down the right hand side through which light is filtering from the outside. Um, and that leads through into this little kind of opening into uh, the one and only swelling in the floor plate in which um, are located 16 seats. Um, and uh, in those 16 seats, um, we hope to make a space that would quiet down some of that complexity that would be surrounded by just one material and in which we could focus on uh, the action of these incredible chefs that were making um, these beautiful, beautiful things, especially for you right in front of you and then serving them themselves to you um, and that these things could be kind of centre stage. And, um, we were really scared about this project for all sorts of reasons. I mean, technologically, um, we'd never done anything like this before. No client walks through the door and says, hey, can you make us a kind of parametrically defined kind of cave-like space uh, overlaid with Arabic kind of patterning and completely kind of computer cut. Um, uh, but also we were delivering a dessert-only restaurant, which is something the city didn't have, and we're delivering it at a, kind of, uh, at a really kind of high end and with only 16 seats. Um, uh, so it was a really kind of nerve-wracking thing um, and we didn't really know whether it would work. A lot of things in Britain have been like that. They've been a kind of um, a punt into, into the kind of future of the city that we weren't always 100% certain w would work. Um, but uh, it just kind of uh, exploded. It was extraordinary. Uh, you know, the, the first um, 
Friday night, there was a, a wait list of three hours for a table in this place. And by the next Monday, DJ turned up at work and said, oh, um, I've just been on the Chinese travel guide to Auckland. Um, Milsey's listed above the Auckland Museum. Um, and, uh, and people just kind of ate it alive. Um, it was extraordinary. And um, it's interesting, uh, I did a talk recently where all of the photographs were drawn purely out of Instagram. And it's amazing uh, how much what kind of insight that gives you into what people are seeing when they're in your places. Um, you know, if you, if you look up hashtag Autolana, all you see is like 500 photographs of the light bulbs and nothing else. Uh, uh, but it was, it was lovely. Mill say I think people were equally as kind of captivated by the otherness of, this, of, of, of the space. You know, they were excited about that, I think, as much as, as, as we were. Um, and that's all I've got. Thank you.